So we are going to end this section with showing you the islands of K. Mm -hmm. So, good step. Can you please get it up there? Uh, K is famous for its beautiful, beautiful beaches. And can you just imagine what happened there when those beaches were colored red because of the blood of the K people? That happened because of that? You don't know. So let's go to the islands and sway with this music. You will uh, find that in the book a lot. Some of the uh, flowers we know, like the datura and the tuberose, and so. I've got a question. <coughs> I think it's very rare to have both Arthur. Let's, let's pay attention to the uh, question here. I think it's very rare to have art, both the authors and the translators in the same room. So my question is actually to all four of you. Um, I guess it's a question of trust that you know you're trusting that the translator will faithfully convey your voice and your style and your writings uh, through the translation. But you know, in America we have this TV show called American Idol where the um, contestants are, are asked to perform songs by established artists, but then they're always told to make it their own. Um, do you feel that that is something that you have to do in order to accomplish your job or, or are you like an actor? You know, tr if you're a translator, are you supposed to be like an actor whose job it is just to try to become that person and, and, and convey that meaning? I mean, how difficult is it to prevent your own, um, your own voice from creeping into the work? Or is it acceptable as a translator to let your own voice and therefore it is part of your work? I mean, what is the dynamic um, for, what is that relationship, what is that dynamic and what is your preference or how do you see it working? Who wants to go first? Haya or Steph? Um, I, can, I can go first. Um, so as a translator, um, I think it's important to stay faithful to the original work and the nuance, like I said. Um, there were probably times when translators are tempted to, you know, have their own voice there. But you know, I think again, this is not my book. You know, I, like I, I translate this work. This is somebody else's. I'm just, you know, giving. Um, I'm just putting it in a different language. But you know, it has to be enjoyable. So that's, I think, for me, that's that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm not. I I don't have the liberty to you know, to fix it or mess up with it. You know. So for me, um, I I. Yeah, I, I, I refrain myself from you know, doing things more than I should on the work. That's right, that's right. And that's where the editor comes in. You know, that it, it's, it's very important to have an editor that knows both languages and really can see and feel in both languages. Uh, that is very, very important, I think, in publishing valid translations. Very well put. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Steph covered it pretty much. Uh, 
it's someone else's work. You're just a conduit to the to which that person can reach a wider audience. And so you have to be as faithful as you can. Uh, there are obviously difficulties. I, I did mention the, the language difficulties. Um, but yeah, you do not take liberties. Um, I do that in my day job. <laughs> I, mean, I can't do that with this because no. that's someone else's name on there, and so you know it's got to be her work full and through. Anyone else? Yes. How has the reception in Asia Indonesia been of your books? Buku saya yang uh, key dalam edisi bahasa Indonesia, menurut bukan menurut saya, menurut orang-orang uh, buku ini uh, lumayan sukses di, di negara saya dalam waktu enam bulan terjual 2.000 lebih eksemplar. Um, Andy says uh, she feels or uh, she's she's told that her her book is actually quite successful, the Indonesian one at least. It's quite successful uh, in Indonesia. It, in the first six months, it sold uh, 2,000 copies. Very Just nice. to give you an idea, uh, 2,000 copies, yeah. I know the States is not blockbuster stuff, but in uh, Indonesia it is, certainly for historical literature. Uh, when you consider the, the kind of stories, this kind of books that do make the bestseller list, uh, it's not this kind of story. So that, that is actually pretty exceptional. When my novel Tanatamu uh, was published in Indonesia, uh, there was a little novel talking about Papua and on that time. And uh, Tanatamu is one of them. Uh, before that, uh, people know uh, Papua as a beautiful island. But the reality is Papua has two faces, the good one. And the bad one, two sides of the face. Uh, when I wrote uh, Tanatabu, makes the reader, wow, is that the reality of Papua? But when they see Papua, they themselves, uh, they, they were surprised, but it makes uh, them. Uh, uh, feel more know, want to know more about Papua, and later uh, after a few years, uh, I found uh, so many books published uh, in Indonesia, and the story are about uh, is about Papua. So I think the uh, my novel Tanah Tabu uh, uh, had. Uh, good effect on Indonesia. Anyone else? Johnny. Um, when reading Daughters, uh, I have my own ideas of why I enjoyed the story being told from the perspective of Kui, the pig, uh, the dog, and the little girl, um, which uh, is, is, I can tell, a very intentional choice. And I thought it delightful, but also really um, meaningful, and I was curious why you chose to do that. Okay. Well, one of my favorite audio is Chris Ola. I love uh, his book, Animal Farm. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, I can say that dog and pig are uh, special pets in Papua. They are raised as a member of family. For Papuan people, dog is a trusted guard and it's used for hunting. And meanwhile, pig is a symbol of wealth and has a social value. And pig was only eaten during rituals or feasts at special occasion or being sacrificed in traditional medication ritual. For Papuan people, 
pig. It's a treasure. That's why a very young piglet always gets a special treatment. A very young piglet sometimes being carried by a purple woman on a string bag, bag called Nokan, and with her baby or toddler on that Nokan, the same Nokan. So I, uh, why I chose uh, that uh, uh, animals as um, my narrators because I. Uh, uh, animals are uh, sentient and perspective. Animals like animals like children are in, in a position of power as we are adults. I think animals often can bring out the best in us because they listen without passing judgment and accept us for who we are without prejudice. Yeah, 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 good. Uh, other questions, please. Oh. Yes. Have you considered publishing this in bilingual? <laughs> and or, not or really, any, in the future? Uh, not really, not really, because there are not enough Indonesian readers, and it would. You mean like our here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe but there's a lot of reasons in the world. It's that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, but our books are used in yeah, Indonesian just... universities in Indonesia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that's, that's yeah. But yeah. to publish them bilingual, yeah. well, it's a lot of paper <laughs> that's gonna get wasted. Know. You know, it's, and a lot yeah. of uh, licensing rights. That's cool. Yeah, I know. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, any more oh, questions? I have a question for yeah. Haya. Yeah. It, um, you said that you relocated to Indonesia when you were 25. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm curious about your background. You, at one point, you said that you feel that the two books um, could only really be done justice by a Indonesian translator. Yeah. There. Does that mean that that although you were in, born in Tanzania, you you're still um, um, your background is still Indonesian, oh, and I'm you were Indian raised. Through and through. My father was Indonesian. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up eating Indonesian food. Uh, I spoke the language quite badly, but I, I still spoke it. And, and so, do I understand the issues affecting Indonesians? Uh, yeah, I'd like to think I do, because I, I you know, I, I have that privilege of, of being able to see through Indonesian eyes, and yet. Also, through you know the non-Indonesian as the Western, if you like. Yeah. Does that help you with the translation? Because for, for the most part, these English translations are being read by Western readers. I, I I would like to think so. Yeah, she was certainly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that says something. I have one more question. Um, in K, one thing I I really love was the, the traditional values and the traditional laws um, are what really saved Kay and its people. And then um, when I also read Daughters, because I actually just finished Kay last night, and then, <laughs> and then it made me reflect on Daughters, especially hearing you talk about it, with it seemed that a lot of the beauty of the tradition in Papua left, it seemed, made uh, the native people vulnerable to the <clears throat> to the influence of the West and to um, it almost seemed as if as though it allowed them to be taken advantage of in some ways. And I was curious if um, there was some traditional law or value in Papua that modern Papuan people um, can fall back to to kind of reclaim what the West has taken. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, about free port, Papua people, uh, most, of, most of them, uh, yeah, doesn't like that. But the reality is, free port. Uh, create uh, a free port uh, make Papua change in uh, a massive change I mean 
well, uh, capitalism that uh, turn uh, traditional power into modern is because of free part. But meanwhile, people a free part uh, destroy the environment. So. Uh, Papua, uh, Papuan people, a peop uh, Freeport has a contract that was signed in Suharto's regime, and pe uh, Papuan people can uh, can do anything because the contract has a law. But now, uh, the contract the contract will, will be ended uh, this year, and uh, Indonesian government try to. Uh, make a new negotiation about that so uh, uh, Freeport can do some uh, change about what they did uh, for Papuan people and they, uh, it's still in progress uh, in, in process I, I hope uh, I hope that uh, the result uh, is uh, the best for Papuan people So, any more questions, please? Yes? So, I have a question for both authors. Um, so, as historical fiction writers, um, what gives you the confidence to write about something that is far away from the reality of your lives? And did you conduct interviews uh, with real subjects? Or otherwise, what made you feel that you have portrait justice to the lives of the subjects of uh, both of your novels? Uh, excuse me. And translate can you please translate to the authors and then uh... Okay, I uh, uh actually I love history because uh uh that's my word. Uh yesterday uh it's uh, uh if we I'm sorry <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, I I try to uh, understand what uh, happened, if I try to understand what have happened today, I should uh, look back to what uh, what happened uh, behind my back. So I uh, I yes I it's it's a hard job. I have to. Uh, I have to uh, learn and read a lot about what happened when I, I uh, when uh, I, I was born, and I uh, read a lot of books, Indonesian history, to uh, keep uh, to make me uh, have uh, more information about that. And when I uh, write about uh, daughters of Papua, I uh, I also uh, join in a mailing list of the native people of Papua and uh, communicate with them about what happened in their uh, homeland. Um, so I Okay, bagi saya itu bukan persoalan saya percaya diri atau tidak percaya diri Tetapi uh, saya merasa berhutang pada seseorang Tahun 2001 saya bertemu dengan seorang pengungsi perempuan yang saya tidak ingat namanya Dan dia berkisah tentang kerusuhan Maluku Ceritanya itu saya simpan dan saya belajar menulis agar bisa menuliskan K Dan uh, saya menulis K bukan berarti saya tidak punya hubungan Kampung saya sangat berdekatan dengan K, pengungsi yang uh, mendapat kerusuhan itu lari ke kampung saya. Dan saya mewawancarai orang uh, yang terkena uh, ko, apa, kerusuhan itu adalah teman-teman kuliah saya. Um, and she says it, it, it's, it wasn't a question of uh, her being confident she could uh, write, <coughs> she, that she could write, uh, do justice to the subject. Uh, she uh, concedes she's not from K, but she says what she did have was 
a moral obligation to a woman who came from K and found refuge in her island, which was uh, essentially next door. Uh, and so she was not, in Ernie's case, she was not removed from the conflict. She, uh, I mean, her village was intimately, you know, involved because a lot of the refugees uh, ended up there in her village. So um, she says, uh, she, she met the, this woman in 2001. Uh, and uh, to this day, she still doesn't know her name. And uh, so she, she felt a moral obligation, a moral debt to, to write about this issue since that time. Anyone else? One? Two? <laughs> this is your last, last chance! Last call! Can I just say a comment? Uh, what? Can I make a comment? Of course you can! I, I really, I really love how um, you chose the, just the significance of Martinez being um, a blacksmith of knives and machetes and how that theme picked through the book in, in, in a really neat way. And, uh, uh, it, it just seems very significant and yeah, nice very intentional. It just, I think it's I amen that. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe one question. Have you ever been threatened or discouraged to write the book? Is there a big challenge to write this book? Sepanjang saya menulis kaya dan kini sudah dibaca sejumlah orang, saya belum pernah mendapat sebuah ancaman. She she never received any threats during the writing or even after the book was published. No, no uh, are the issues that um, you wrote about, uh, both of you, uh, the K and the daughters of Papua, are they, are they issues that, um, I mean, like you said, they, they happened uh, only in recent history, you know, 15 years or so ago, etc. But are those same issues, or those underlying issues, still present and could flare up again today? Persoalan agama di Indonesia memang masih ada sampai sekarang. Indonesia khususnya Indonesia Timur itu uh, ketika kita bicara tentang agama itu sangat sensitif dan bisa menimbulkan peperangan memang. Uh, tapi saya pikir Indonesia itu adalah negara yang kuat dan kita punya modal. Uh, salah satu itu adalah kearifan yang kita miliki. Uh, Indonesia sudah berkali-kali ditempah malapetaka dan tetap kita tetap masih berdiri di sebagai sebuah negara. Uh, um, the, the central theme of, of her book, uh, this uh, social issue here, is, is uh, obviously religious differences. And uh, she says, yes, religious differences are still a problem in Indonesia. And especially in Eastern Indonesia, uh, the region where K is located. Um, that's because, you know, any kind of the smallest sectarian difference can, can easily cause, you know, lead to violence. And um, she said that, uh, you know, that issue is still there, but the important thing is that uh, you know Indonesia as a nation can has been shown to to get through this kind of thing through through traditional wisdoms like like uh, in K like has happened in K. So it's just a matter of embracing you know uh, the traditions that have been practiced by generations past. John. Yeah. Well, um, I like to hear oh, oh 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 sorry sorry. My, my, my answer is simple. If Freeport is still there, then the issue is still there. That's it. <laughs> my question is the uh, for everything that happened in Indonesia, including what happened to Maluku and Papua, no one has been arrested who instigate the problem. In your opinion, what do you think? Um, 
sebenarnya uh, kerusuhan di K itu pun sama dengan uh, apa yang terjadi di Papua kekacauan yang terjadi di Papua. Jadi agama hanya tu, hanyalah sebagai kambing hitam juga. Ada hal-hal yang kita tidak bisa jangkau seperti uh, kekuatan raksasa seperti perusahaan-perusahaan besar karena di K pun ada perusahaan minyak. Uh, tapi saya tidak perlu menyebutkan negaranya, saya perlu menyebutkan negaranya. Uh, ada perusahaan minyak dari uh, Kanada yang ketika kerusuhan itu terjadi, eh, setelah terus sebelum kerusuhan terjadi itu, salah satu hutan di K itu sudah dipasangi uh, patok uh, patok dari uh, perusahaan di dari Kanada. Uh, it, it's the, 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 uh, she says the issue, the issue in K, the conflict in K is uh, it, similar to the conflict in Papua. In, in that uh, there, there was a, uh, I guess, I guess a foreign hand behind it. Um, in Papua's case, obviously, it's I, I hesitate to say obviously, it's Freeport. Um, in, in K, it's a. Apparently, a Canadian oil company that was behind it, and um, they were they were you know uh, fencing off forested land in on the K Islands uh, shortly before the the violence broke up, uh, broke out, and um, uh, and for many people they, they feel that um, the the violence, uh, the at least the this idea of religious differences was was used as a as a I guess a useful lightning rod to 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 spark the violence and perhaps further the interests of this world company. But usually the, it's done by the military, by the Indonesian military. I, I can I have have her answer that. Soal ini uh, saya juga uh, saya mendapat uh, pengetahuan bahwa di K militer itu turut uh, menyebabkan kisru di sana militer itu berpihak pada salah satu agama di sana. Uh, the military was very much involved in the violence in K. The, and she says the military. Uh, clearly took sides with one of the religious groups. Okay, so going back on that question, what do you, how do you feel uh, that there's no um, arrest toward whoever instigate this event? sakit sekali dan memang segala persoalan di Indonesia mulai dari kematian Munir itu sampai sekarang kita berjuang dan tidak ada pengadilan dan, dan itulah Indonesia dan kami berharap Indonesia kedepannya uh, akan berubah. She says for her, uh, you know, that there's never been anyone arrested. It's, it's very painful, uh, but it's not a, a, a situation unique to K because this has happened throughout Indonesia's history. She she cited the example of Monir. Monir was a human rights activist. He was uh, murdered by the, I guess, the Indonesian version of the CIA. Um, of course, that's not the official line. Uh, and to date, uh, he, there, no one has ever been uh, sentenced or, or even brought to justice for, for masterminding his death, although the person who did serve him the poison has been done. Sampai hari ini, para uh, para pejuang kemanusiaan di Indonesia tengah mengusahakan uh, sebuah pengadilan kemanusiaan seperti uh, pengadilan uh, untuk kasus 65 dan kematian Munir dan uh, uh, dalam kerusuhan itu sampai sekarang masih terus diperjuangkan dan uh, hanya itu yang saya bisa jawab. Um, Oke, okay, saya you know, despite the fact that so, so many uh cases, uh, rights abuses and so on have, have never actually been brought to justice. 
rights activists are still trying to uh, to call for a, a tribunal for uh, rights abuses, and that includes the 1965 uh, the massacre of suspected communist sympathizers, uh, the the murder, murder uh, the K conflict as well. Again, they're trying to 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 get justice. But, uh, about what happened in Papua, I can tell you it's hard to put a freeport on trial because they are, uh, they have a big power over Papua, Indonesia and even the world. But I hope in the future, that they have Thank you. Anything else? Then I think that I'm going to thank all of you for being here and being interested and helping me to welcome these sets of authors and translators. This is their opening night of a week of presentations and we will be all over the Bay Area. So tomorrow we are going to Martin Luther King and San Jose State University is hosting us. Wednesday we will be in Berkeley at University Press Books on Bancroft. On Thursday we're going to take a break, oh. believe it or not. <laughs> and then on Friday we will be in the Foster City Library. And on Saturday we will have a grand finale at the uh, Wisma Indonesia where uh, the Consul General and his lovely wife have generously invited us and the host to the farewell of, I hope, a pretty exciting week. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you.